Hello and welcome to this talk on uh, how multiple dikes can facilitate volcanic eruptions with application to the Reykjanes Peninsula. So most eruptions are supplied with magma through dikes or inclined seats. And here is one uh, dike fed eruption, uh, the one from uh, 8th of February now in 2024 on the Reykjanes Peninsula at the Sundnuka fissure, which is still active as I speak, uh, close to the town of uh, Grindavik. But propagating dikes or dike injections often become arrested. If you look at this illustration here, we see that there was a 15 kilometer long dike indicated by the earthquakes here, and I marked it in here. 15 kilometer long dike was emplaced uh, on the Reykjanes Peninsula on the 10th of November, 2023. And none of this dike, no part of this dike made it to the surface at that time. Later, parts of the dike were used as, as feeders for the eruptions on uh, December 2023 20, and January, February, and March 2024. Uh, the last one is still ongoing. But the resulting fissures were always at the surface much, much shorter than this uh, 15 kilometer long dike. Even more, if we go to Faradalsfjall, which is located here, so the eruptions that we are looking at uh, uh, now, today in Iceland, are close to this town of Grindavik. And in, in the years before, we had three eruptions here in Faradalsfjall. So there have been four now in vicinity of Grindavik, in, in the fissure called Sundnuka, and three in uh, Faradalsfjall in the years 2021 to 23. Now, if you look at those, I've indicated here the dike at around two kilometers depth. The dike there was nine kilometers long. But the volcanic fissures that came to the surface were only a few hundred meters long in each case of this uh, of these three eruptions. So clearly the greater part of the dike became arrested. Perhaps the most dramatic example of a dike being much, much longer than the volcanic fissure that it's uh, supplying magma to is from Baulabunga in central Iceland in 2014 to 15 in eruption there. The dike was at least 45 kilometers long segmented here, you see, uh, from segment one to segment eight, where it be. But all these segments basically were arrested at depth, maybe one or two kilometers depth and didn't make it to the surface except this 8B here at the end, that made it to the surface, where a volcanic fissure formed, but the fissure was only well, initially maybe 1,500 meters, but mostly three, 700 meters, and then gradually became one, one crater cone that uh, erupted for a long time. So we see clearly here that the dike, the feeder dike, is much longer than any of the volcanic fissures it gives rise to, so meaning that most of the dike is arrested. Now, arrested dikes are commonly seen in the field, as we see here. This is from East Iceland. First, I show you a photo of the arrested dike. The arrested tip is here. And we are around 1,000 meters down in the old uh, lava pile. It's an 8 million year old, 10 million year old sort of rocks that we're looking at here. So the dike is arrested here after contact with another lava flow above. And we see a close up here where the a uh, person is standing, giving you the, the scale, so the dike is arrested here. So this is very common to see dikes arrested or dike segments arrested in the field. We can look at more, more examples. Here, Santorini, in the colder of also Santorini in Greece, we see a dike arrested uh, just below the rim of the caldera. The caldera, caldera rim is here, the surface of the rim is here. So the dike became arrested in relatively compliant rocks, uh, pyroclastic rocks here. So the tip is relatively rounded. But here in Tenerife, we see similar things. Basaltic dike coming up in, through a pyroclastic or, uh, or pyroclastic rocks at least, meeting with a stiff lava flow and becoming arrested here. So this is very common. We see dikes arrested at contacts between mechanically dissimilar rocks. Again, um, Santorini, 
a dike, thin dike comes up here, the golden rim goes through some uh, tuff layers and basaltic lava flows and then becomes arrested at a contact between a lava flow and pyroclastic rocks or scoria here. Similarly here, on the Reykjanes Peninsula, this photo will show you again, or this dike will show you again with a different perspective from the air. Uh, this is an arrested dike in the westernmost part of the Reykjanes Peninsula, not far from where the eruption is going on today. And this dike became arrested only five to six meters below the surface. So of course, dikes can find various parts. I indicate here some of them uh, in, in here in A and B, the dike comes straight from a magma reservoir at depth, similar to what we are having now in the Reykjanes Peninsula. So the, the depth to the reservoir could be say 10, 15 kilometers or something like that. So the dike comes up and only part of it reaches the surface as you see in all cases. So much of the dike becomes arrested at several kilometers depth in the crust, often under a stress barrier or at a contact between mechanically dissimilar rocks. Then in addition, in many places we have, of course, in addition to the magma deep seated reservoir, we have a shallow chamber and they can combine to uh, generate an eruption like here. Probably this was the case in, in the Krabla fires in, in Northern Iceland in 75 to 84, that I will discuss a little bit better uh, in a little bit more detail later on in this talk. So we, we have many possibilities. Now, theoretically, each dike or inclined sheet has an infinite number of potential paths from its source here to the surface or to the place where it becomes arrested in the crust. And the path it selects is thought to be uh, the one that minimizes, minimizes the so-called action. Action is really the, the equation here. That's the difference, the integral of the difference between the kinetic energy and the potential energy. Now for dikes, the kinetic energy is, uh, they are slow moving, so the kinetic energy is not very important. And then this principle, Hamilton's principle, reduces to the principle of minimum potential energy, the minimum potential energy. Now what does that mean? It means if we are dealing with dikes formed as extension factors, mode one cracks, in fracture mechanics, as most dikes and inclined sheets are, then this principle means that they must follow the trajectories or the orientation of sigma one, the maximum principle compressive stress, and parallel with sigma two as well, the intermediate one, and be per perpendicular to sigma three, the minimum principle compressive stress. So they are parallel with the maximum principle compressive stress and perpendicular to the minimum one. Now this means we can to numerical models that allow us to forecast the likely dike paths. Now, the simplest model is the one where we have the crust of the volcano, homogeneous and isotropic, no layering, no layering at all. If that was the case, and people often use this kind of model, if that would be the case, then every dike that had any significant overpressure, driving pressure, magmatic pressure to drive it, would go to the surface it would go to the surface. It follows the trajectories of sigma one and goes to the surface, as we show here in one, two, three, and four. And obviously they don't. Obviously they don't. Dikes do not all go to the surface. Probably the great majority of the segments injected are become rusted. And I show you here again, this beautiful example from the Regulus Peninsula. It's located here at the Southwestern tip. And this dike is a thin one became arrested five to six meters below the free surface of the active rift zone. Why? Partly because there's an older um, feeder dike close by that generated horizontal compression and partly because this one goes through compliant or soft pyroclastic layers and meets with a stiff lava flow at the top where the stress field rotates presumably and became unfavorable. So what this means is that if we ignore the layering, which is everywhere in volcanoes, of course, the rift zones, if we ignore the layering, we can never really explain the likely paths of dike propagation and how and why some dikes become arrested and others make it to the surface. 
So when the dike meets with a contact, it can become totally arrested, like here in A. It can become deflected into a sill in one direction, here in B, into a sill in two directions in the vertical section, in C, or penetrate. Now, if the contrast is so that layer A, or the upper layer is much stiffer, higher young spot than the lower one, there's a great tendency for the dike to become arrested or deflected into a sill. Whether it's become deflected into a sill depends on its old pressure. Now, this is what we are apparently observing uh, uh, or monitoring today in the uh, geothermal field of Svartsengi, close to the uh, close to the Sundugahraun fissure, where the volcanic activity on the Regnitz Peninsula is taking place today. So I'll discuss that a little bit later. So if we make a very simple numerical modeling, but still with some layers, we get the situation here. So the dikes will follow these sigma one trajectories, these little ticks. And if they rotate by 90 degrees like here, the dike cannot go through. It cannot go through. It can be deflected then into a sill like here. Again, something we believe is going on in the Svarsink and, and Sunduga fissure in, in the in, in uh, southwest Iceland or the Regions Peninsula currently. Or it can be arrested altogether, like an A here, or possibly become a sill for a while and then deflect again either into a uh, an inclined seat, such as you're here, or possibly to a vertical dike, as we believe happens in Svarsinki and in Sundunga Fisher. Here we see again a numerical model showing um, that when the layering is at a shallow depth or where the contact between layers is at a shallow depth, the contact may open up, like I show here. This is opening up, there's a dike propagating up here, opens up the contact, and the dike may then altogether stop when it meets the open contact or change into a sill. This is in mechanics called the Cook-Gordon delamination mechanism of fracture arrest in general, and here we apply it to dikes. And we see this, of course, in the field. Here is an example from Southwest Iceland. The dike comes up here to a contact between mechanically dissimilar rocks, it becomes deflected into a sill for a while and then propagates up again as a dike. Now you could say, you could easily say, this is a small scale version or what people believe they are seeing and observing in Svartsengi, this geothermal field in southwest Iceland, where there apparently are sills. So the dike comes from depth into a sill at four or five kilometers depth, uh, propagates laterally, as so the magma propagates laterally, and then goes again into dike, namely the St. Luca Fisher uh, dike that is uh, feeding the eruptions that we have been seeing in the last months and we are seeing today. Of course, you can uh, have other situations where you, the dike doesn't necessarily have to change into a sill. It can propagate laterally under a stress barrier like we see here. This is likely what happened in Barla Bunga in 2014 and 15, and in a way happened in the Fajardasfjall eruptions or dike propagation episodes from 2021 to 2023. There was a little bit more complex there, but still the, the origin of the magma there was in a deep seated reservoir, 10, 12, 15 kilometers depth. A dike propagated partly vertically and partly laterally, and only a tiny fraction of the dikes there reached the surface. The fissures were only a few hundred meters long, whereas, as I said earlier, the dike was nine kilometers long. So why is it so difficult for dikes to go through the surface, uh, through, through the crust to the surface? Well, because if there is a layering with a lot of different mechanical properties, they tend to arrest the dike or deflect it or arrest the dike. So for a dike to have a chance to go all the way to the surface, the stress field, the local stress field along the dike, potential dike path has to be homogenized. So that means the stresses are everywhere with the same orientation. The principal stress are everywhere with the same orientation, meaning for a dike, sigma one is vertical uh, and sigma three is perpendicular to the dike. So how can nature homogenize uh, a pile like this one here? One way of doing it 
is to send dikes in. So dikes going in first to a certain dis distance up into the crust and then further and further and gradually reaching the surface. And this leads to multiple dikes. I show it here in this example. A is the first dike. It homogenizes the stress field around it first by its overpressure when it's active. And later on, when it's solidified, the rock of the dike, the dike rock, everywhere has the same mechanical properties. So that also leads to homogenization. So later dikes can either go in the center of the first one or along the margin of the first one and gradually becomes thicker and thicker, more and more what we call columnar rows. So we see it here in a cross section and perhaps in a more realistic way here in this illustration here where I show not only the columnar rows, which I indicating the injections of, 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 of dikes, uh, but also the common observation that where it passes through different rock layers like scoria, uh, the dike may be slightly inclined and then often, often thinner. So here are examples of uh, multiple dikes in Iceland. Uh, we have here, all of them are multiple in the sense that they are all composed of the same rock type, basalt. You see a gentleman standing here. So here are seven rows. Here are four or five rows. In, this is in the northern Iceland. This is in northwestern Iceland. Uh, this one again is in northwestern Iceland. You can see at least five rows of, of, uh, of uh, dike injections, all basaltic except this top here from East Iceland, which is composite. And composite means that part of the dike has totally different composition from the rest. So here we have basaltic margins and rhyolitic or acid center. Uh, this, one, this, this type of dike injection is also very common. So we have seen examples from Iceland in recent years and decades of multiple dikes, eventually giving rise to eruptions. Uh, the dikes, uh, dike injections in Krapla in Northern Iceland, 75 to 84. I show them here below. Uh, there were many injections. There were around 20, 25 injections of dikes and uh, nine led to eruptions. And the gradual increase in thickness of the feeder dike is indicated here. Then we had uh, multiple dikes. Uh, well, in addition, I should say that the, the, the dike in Krapla was in fact a, partly along the same path as a dike from 17, 29, so it's a multiple in sense in that sense as well. Then we had in Baradabunga, that feed the dike, that followed the dike from around 1800, so it's a, clearly a multiple dike there, an old dike called the Holerone uh, dike. In Fyradalsfjad, yes, we have had many seg segment injections from 2021 to 2023, and now in the Sundnuga fissure, that is, in fact, an old fissure, an old feeder dike, around 2,300 years old, that the dikes today are using. So we have definitely a multiple dike there that make the, make the eruptions easier. So that's the main, main conclusion of this talk. And with those words, I say thank you very much indeed.